Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us on tonight. Yeah, yeah. Tonight's going to be a special episode. <laughs> what we're going to talk about and we're also going to talk about the beauty pageant that we just had last um, February 14th at Soundgarden Club 21 the Miss Valentine Sweetheart Beauty and the Beats pageant and hip hop show and Crystal tell us about your experience so how was it it was really good I haven't really done a lot of modeling before or pageantry for that matter and you made the experience so much fun. It just was a great environment. All the girls were so nice. It was just fabulous to be around so many empowered women. Yeah. And it was just a great competition all around. Yeah, yeah. Everybody had lots of fun. Like, there were a lot of um, hip-hop artists um, that were performing in between the segments. And um, there were eight girls that were able to make it, all very beautiful girls, and all did fantastic. Um, there was um, casual wear, swimsuit wear, and Valentine apparel wear. Now, if you want to see the pictures from the show, you can go to pumpedentertainment.com slash gallery and scroll down until you see the uh, Beauty and the Beats uh, beauty pageant show. And you can see Crystal's pictures there and everybody else's pictures and stuff. It, it was such a great night. Unfortunately, you weren't able to make it. No, unfortunately, I wasn't. <laughs> I had bit, I had other plans that night. Yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. Being in the fact that it was on Valentine's Day. And I know a lot like, of people weren't able to I make out, it. Of course, like any other couple that is in a relationship, they make plans, and yeah. Unfortunately, um, I didn't get to make it, but I did see the photos, and they looked absolutely phenomenal. Like everyone's outfits looked awesome. Our and, stage setup was awesome. I love those heart balloons I, I picked those <laughs> I love anything pink so. yeah <laughs> so how, did you have an idea that you know like oh I think I'm gonna win honestly no um, I think self praise is no praise at all and <laughs> all the women were so beautiful yeah and, and I just love that there was so much body inclusion happening right mm -hmm. and quite frankly there's two or three other girls that I thought were going to be ahead of me. So <laughs> it was a nice surprise, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You won by a huge margin. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> by a huge margin. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, um, so, Crystal, tell us about your costume. Because your costume for the Valentine Sweetheart, the Valentine Apparel, was really, really good. Tell us, the, I know you put a lot of hard work into it. Tell us about those. Tell us about it. Well, I wore a corset and matching little booty shorts, but the big thing was the wings. And actually, it only took me like 16 hours to make them, <laughs> which is not bad, right? I've seen, I've watched documentaries for Victoria's Secret and how they make their wings, and it can take them months to do. Mm -hmm. And I. They were huge white wings. With like how many? 280 feathers? Actually, 400 hand placed feathers. 400. And then six feather boas. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, and then we used like a metal wire for the inside and then a shiny white sheet. And then we glued all the feathers on individually. It looked really good. Thank you. Congratulations again. You deserve your win. Thank you so much. So, Tom. Tell us um, what you've been doing lately. Like, how do I, first of all, how did you get started on uh, in modeling? 
I first started out three and a half years ago actually with a company, um, Axis, that's actually just on the south end of town. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, uh, they had their own little promotion and it started, I think, just a few years before I joined the team. It was around 2012, if I remember correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. Michelle, yeah, you get the shout out because you got me started. Thank you very much. <laughs> so they had the company. Shout out to Michelle. Yeah. So they had the organization called Axis Images. It was just taking models and just working as a promotional team itself. We weren't actually doing anything like really huge in town. We, although we did actually help intrigue lingerie, uh, that mm -hmm. males did particularly. Uh, I have a friend named Evan Peters, so, and him and I just clicked when we first started working together. Mm -hmm. We helped intrigue uh, for like the Black Friday sale. Mm -hmm. And basically what we did for our gig is that we just wore a dress shirt which was just a white button up shirt but it was like nothing and we had it everything off you didn't have time. underwear underneath no don't worry we did <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, if, if we did it yeah we charge <laughs> Sorry, i'm kidding i'm kidding he folks. can teach you but he has to charge <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> but we actually got to demo their silk boxers and i still have that pair to this day oh we wow got to keep them for free that's good. So we really didn't have a lot of people come in that night, but we actually did have a fair amount of customers that were intrigued from the sales that they had. And we didn't really have men, but we just did have me and Evan, just like the little little male models that looked really special. We just wore the underwears. We had a little bow tie. We had a tray of drinks and cookies. <laughs> and everybody would come in to buy their stuff. Not a, not a bad thing to first start off. And, and no. actually, you kind of get your jitters away from when you have really strange people that just look at you like, wait, what is this guy doing? Wait. Oh my God! Like the girls my age back then, were like a little bit more shocked. But the older women are like, "Oh, what do you know, boy toy?" Yeah, <laughs> I can be here. Yeah, okay. it's a tasty treat. Cougars on the prowl. <laughs> actually, one did say that to me: "Tasty treats." And I'm like, "Okay, I'm, I'm happy with the compliment." Mm -hmm. And that's actually how I originally got started. Was actually through here, and that was with Axis Images, and I just kept on rolling it ever since. That's usually how um, male models usually get started. Anyway, um, doing like underwear modeling. Because it shows your physique, you know, it shows like, you know, what you're capable of going to the extreme and you're comfortable wearing those, um, those kinds of um, apparel that you can move on to other kinds of um, wear, like, you know, apparel. So, you know, that's a good start. Yeah, and also we did like fun little photo shoots. We did like themed ones. We did skull candy ones. We did like mm -hmm. a dark and white version of Alice in Wonderland. Um, I played the Mad Hatter, and I had a little fun with that one. So we were just not doing it very seriously. We just did it for fun just because yeah. Because we weren't, like, the serious people when we did it. Mm -hmm. We just did it for fun, and we actually, that in February 2016, then we had our own little fashion show. We helped local businesses just to show their clothing lines. Mm -hmm. There's a swimmer company on the north side. I actually forgot their name, but we demonstrated their swimsuits. We had um, a couple local stores that we just tried on their outfits. And we had about two shows for an entire day, and we did it for about three hours each. We had, um, actually, some of you in um, the YQL know who Francesca is. Francesca uh, Dynamites, yeah. yeah. Love her. Yeah. Um, Francesca and I, who I knew from years ago, like her and I are friends, but we had a little dance group back then, and we had a little hip-hop group. Um, we had a guy named AJ, and then we had Francesca and myself, and we performed AJ for fame, right? A She's Filipino? No, this is oh. a woman. This is a man. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So we had our own little dance group, and we performed for Leftbridge Pride Fest twice for two straight years. And mm -hmm. then we performed for the fashion show. We just wanted to have a little bit of fun, so we demonstrated what we had for our dances. Mm-hmm. Ooh, we right Sorry. back after these messages. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, yeah, and after that, I took a little hiatus from modeling because um, I was – going to school and I was getting my second diploma from college yeah. at the time and when I did that I did maybe two shoots and then after that I was looking at a few different agencies so I just wanted to test the waters and see what they were all about mm -hmm. I first went to try out for Numa asked them what they were about and then I tried Sophia International Models yeah Sophia I ended up actually doing a test shoot for for which I didn't get the position to be a part of the team, but I'm actually glad that happened just because I wasn't taking it too seriously. I was more focused on my schooling, and mm -hmm. that for me was more important from what I was trying to achieve. But it was also the experience of doing it, right? Like, you know, if um, if you say, like, for acting too and modeling, for, um, say, you go to, to 10 auditions or 10 model calls, and if you get, like, 
less than half of it, you know, like two or three, that's, it's good, you know, you're getting somewhere, right? Because that's, it's all trial and error, right? And trial. exposure, you know, and just the experience. Yeah, the experience of it. So, so, you know, oh, so this is how it is. This is what they want. This is what I should do next time, right? Mm -hmm. And they gave me tips along the way, but I took it more seriously right after school ended. Then mm -hmm. I met a few of the male models that I actually kept in contact with and message every once in a while, ask them about what it is I can do and approve, and I met more along the way. Mm -hmm. And then when the Leftbridge Fashion Show started happening, I did one in 2017, it's when I met Shelly, who organizes the whole entire show. It's when I met more of the models who are more local in town. There's mm -hmm. a couple of them who are signed by a couple agencies, but the ones who I really met and still keep in contact with is more the male models. Um, one who actually just recently moved to Calgary, uh, his name is Benny Willis. Mm -hmm. He actually is now um, going to be going to Toronto this year, and he's competing for what's called Supermodel Canada Search. This is the second year in a row. We, him and I, both did it last year, and that's how I met him was actually through actually a photo shoot, mm -hmm. and he gives me tips and he helps me along the way as far is as. Is Benny a model or a designer? He's a model, and he's been doing it for actually a lot longer than I have, and that's how. I was able to actually understand, okay, what does a male model actually need to represent himself for, and how is he going to build his portfolio, and what's the message that he wants to bring to himself into the industry. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got the word out, was because of him, and that's how I got a little bit more intrigued with male modeling, and trying to test the waters and trying different genres because of that, mm -hmm. and so I still keep that in mind. And now, for since last year, I took it way more seriously, but as far as trying to develop my own content and trying to find my own style, I need to find the perfect place for that. And I think it's because of doing all that stuff from 2017 from that fashion show all the way to where I'm at right now, I found the platform for what I really want. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot because, you know, within a year, you don't really get the exposure that you want. You know, you still have to kind of like test the waters. Mm -hmm. Any new female or male model has to do like TFPs, that's like trade for photo or time for print. Mm -hmm. So they have to get used to the idea of being in front of the camera, be, be comfortable and meet other photographers, but mm -hmm. also be very careful at the same time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's about safety and it's about your own mm -hmm. style because not every photographer is going to agree with you. Not everyone is going to like your style, but you just have to accept it. But you, you got to learn how to, you got to find the ones that you can get along with and you can work with, you know, and you got to also make sure you protect yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. Make sure you yeah, read the, um, the model agreements that it would not be used for anything, you know, which is, you know, against your, um, values and your, your professional, um, outlook about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to make sure that you're always protected. You, you do time for print um, to develop your portfolio because in the beginning, um, you're not going to get, not automatically right away going to get paid, um, paid photo shoots mm -hmm. that you're going to get paid for. But once people see how you look in pictures, how you, how you picture, then and you build your portfolio. You you collect pictures from different photographers, and you say, "Oh, I've worked with this photographer. I've worked with that photographer, and these are my pictures." And that's how you get work. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can start a website. You can start a Facebook page. You know, mm -hmm. um, back in the days, we didn't have social media, so you have to have your own uh, website. I had JuliaMartinez.com, and when I when I first started, actually, actually, I've been doing the show for a while now, and I've never really introduced myself. And um, uh, I was um, an actress in Vancouver, a spokesmodel for car shows and lingerie wear. And um, I've been doing events coordinating for since 2003. And um, done quite a few things, but... Um, yeah, I, I'm a little bit older now, so, well, that's where this uh, part of our show is uh, is going to be opened up. Um, I kind of reduced the amount of that kind of work that I was doing because I started having a mental illness when um, in 2005, and it's uh, it's it, it can be debilitating, but you know I have worked my way through it and which brings us to um, another part of our this part of the segment of our show where we talk about mental illness 
and um, and our our industry. You know, like there's so many models, actors, artists, you know, performers who have mental illnesses, and they try to hide it, or sometimes they hide it, they hide it, they hide it until they can no longer hold it, mm -hmm. and people always have this stigma about it, you know, that it should be frowned upon, it should be, it's, it's a disability, it's an impairment, but um, it shouldn't be, it doesn't have to be. Like, I'm, you know, talk, would you like to share something about that? With well, us? I feel like when it comes to um, people having their mental illnesses, a big part of that is being pushed outside of your comfort level and boundaries. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be pushed outside of your comfort levels and boundaries, but I'm saying that you need to have very clear boundaries and be very understanding of what's happening within your own self. And when you get to a certain point that you're not comfortable, you should never push yourself past that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, you should stay where you're comfortable and where you're where you're supported, mm -hmm. where you get a lot of support and, you know, understanding. And um, don't push yourself to the point that it stresses out your brain. Yes. You know, yeah. like, ta would you like uh, to share something with us about that? Yeah, and I have to agree with you, Crystal. It's about the self-awareness part. And if you recognize it at a very young age, if those who are very lucky to, they're very fortunate to understand because even in, to, even in today, today's society, which unfortunately still to this day, we still face a stigma that we still have to fight. To this day, I still hear a lot of people using terms that which are not used in the most proper way. Um, there's lots of psych psychological terms that I learned in my days when I was learning at the college, getting, getting my education at the time, and I had no idea what those terms meant. But then when I took my degree over it, and then I learned even in my own health what I was trying to overcome, I was able to finally understand what mm -hmm. these terms actually meant. Am I able to overcome this? And what can I do? And what's the main source of the problem that I first came up with? Mm -hmm. It's very ignorant and insensitive when people use those terms, like, inappropriately, you know? Like, mm -hmm. why? You know? Like, there's a proper terminology for it, and we are all people here. Everybody has their own shortcomings yeah. and their own um, strengths and stuff. So. You sh it shouldn't be put down. It should be supported. It should be understood. It should be um, accepted, not not as something that you know debilitates you f and hinders you from doing what you're supposed to do. But something that is just a a a, a part of how people are all unique. Mm -hmm. People all have um, good things and hard and things that they have to deal with. We all do, mm -hmm. you know, we all do, like even the ones that call themselves normal, mm -hmm. you know, like, well, who's normal these days anyway, right? So what actually is normal? Yeah. yeah. There's nothing in this world that really is normal nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like there's a very large lack of understanding for just the entire realm of mental health and illness, um, whether it's anxiety or bipolar there's just so many people that don't understand the aspects of it and i mean really how are you fully supposed to understand all the different spectrums of it yeah right? well there's um probably the the most, most severe severe case cases would be like schizophrenia mm -hmm. that's what i have i have um i um get um auditory hallucinations mm -hmm. sometimes when I have episodes mm -hmm. and I, I used to get um, visual hallucinations mm -hmm. and I, that has stopped. Um, I do get regularly treated mm -hmm. but it does affect your mood. Um, it doesn't affect your character. It shouldn't, it shouldn't affect your character. You're always going to be who you are inside and these things that um, make make life a little bit less easy for you are only just to challenge your strength and character mm -hmm. you know like like what they say you know when when the, when when the going gets tough the tough gets going right mm -hmm. you know so it shows like how how you truly are mm -hmm. you know that the, this despite the fact that say you may be sick at this time but you still keep a good open mind you still have a good heart 
you know, good intentions never change. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it remains the same. And then there's bipolar. Mm -hmm. um, bipolar is um, people who are manic depressive. Have you guys? That's also a spectrum, though. Yeah. Right. Like not everybody who's manic depressive is actually on the bipolar end of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I really feel like the biggest part of that is just, um, I guess not, not understanding, but acceptance. You know, and taking that person for who they are and loving them anyways. And if you can help them just by supporting them, just by listening to them, mm -hmm. that to me is the most important thing. And I always say to my friends when they're having a moment. Do you want to rant or do you want advice? Because not everybody wants to hear what you have to say when they need to say what they are feeling. And yeah. Also, I mean, we still have like people that just want to have like this moment where they think they can have it like done in a quick fix when that's just not really a possibility, especially mm -hmm. for people that don't really truly understand what the person's going through. Because mm -hmm. we don't really use our ears when we're listening to a person. We don't actually really understand for what it is that their story is trying to say mm -hmm. because their words and their tone of voice, and if you even check their body language mm -hmm. it will tell you the whole entire thing and that's what it takes requires a lot of patience a lot of time understanding and, and it also takes a special character to even even yeah. know exactly what it means to be in that person's shoes because mm -hmm. what you're doing is actually just getting a taste mm -hmm. that's all it is mm -hmm. you're not living their life but you are getting a taste of what it is to be in their shoes just a little window to their life mm -hmm. and because they're wanting to expose it and it's kind of hard for people to even trust people with that kind of information about them is just because who do you know that's really going to be there just to listen mm -hmm. because us as people really mm -hmm. want to have a quick fix you know they want to take whatever it is that they can but if you really understand for what the issue is what you have for your disability or even if it's a learning disability mm -hmm. then you really know what you can do as far as like the beginning steps because everything needs to start with one step and if you can't get to that one step that's usually the most difficult then after when you get past that first step then the process itself just gets people so much easier mm -hmm. with or without help and if you yeah. know what it is. Mm -hmm. I understand that on a different level because my children are special needs and it's like once we got the diagnosis we were able to move forward and learn about what they needed and how we could help them and help them grow into these amazing little rainbow children. <laughs> I'm on a different spectrum. I actually on that side. So I grew up with special needs, and I grew up in a very early diagnosis. Mm -hmm. At three and a half, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. But then they were trying to re-diagnose me, and they didn't see that I was ADHD or even was on the capable level as I got older. But for five years in a row, I was living in a major depressive cycle from 17 all the way until I was 22. Mm -hmm. And I was using substances to bottle up my emotions and to bottle up my disorder. And I didn't even know I had it until I got properly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen until I moved down here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was very thankful for that because my home life and my work life back in my home, where I came from, I'm originally from Shore Park. And I was not living the happiest life when I was taking care of my family. I had a mom and a sister that were very, very mentally ill, and also struggling with their work, and they weren't working, and I was the one who was stepping up to the plate, but very forced into the position, and I was already dealing with my own trauma, my mm -hmm. own trauma in my own life, too, and that just added on top of it, and then I moved down here, and I'm okay to talk about this as well, but I actually tried to commit suicide twice in my life. The first time I was 70 years old, and it was shortly right after my grandfather died, um, Losing a very important person in my life really affected me in much bigger ways than I didn't even realize because I had no idea how crumbling my own soul will get little by little each time. And then I was 21 the second time I tried it and it was still everything that I was facing from my home life, bottling it up but also because I met a girl shortly right afterwards and for the first time I actually had actual emotional and physical feelings for a girl like mm -hmm. I fell in love for the first time in my life and when you hear the news like they don't feel about that about you mm -hmm. you just get shattered mm -hmm. and then everything just comes crashing down and then you're wondering if you're worth it yeah nine and a half months later of like treatment and recovery it took so long to recognize I finally recognized a problem mm -hmm. and it was lasting for five years and it didn't I didn't never realized it until I said it was my grandfather that died, that started it all. That triggered it. That yeah. triggered it. And then I had to backtrack 
where it all began and who I was beforehand. Mm -hmm. Because you can lose yourself so easily mm -hmm. when you're majorly depressive or you have a manic disorder mm -hmm. that either requires medication or you're using substances mm -hmm. that will bottle it down and it just triggers more and more and it never gets better. Because your body and your brain can actually rewire itself when you add harmful substances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's that rewiring it yourself and it's that um, self-induced um, like neuropathy where you're trying to rewire your own brain yeah. and, and make yourself a better version of yourself, mm -hmm. you know? That's where medication, treatment, and therapy uh, has, has, has to come in, you know, because there are mental illnesses that are um, chemical imbalances in your brain that actually need chemical, physical help. Mm -hmm. And a, a, accompanied with therapy and counseling and understanding and support from loved ones and people close to you, mm -hmm. you can you can't succeed in life. You can get far. You can, you know, do even better than those who don't have a mental illness. You know, because if you, I'm pretty sure you guys know this, that most people who are like really, really good artists and talented and unique have mental illnesses. Most of them. I feel like everybody in their own way has had some sort of a struggle. Yeah. You know? That and can easily, like, turn into mm -hmm. a mental illness. Yeah. yeah, and it's so easy to get exposed to because mm -hmm. now with the gen our gen with the different generations that are coming up and how technology is advancing, it's so easy for kids to get influenced by the most harmful things out there. Yeah. And also the message can be passed the wrong way as well, and they just don't understand. It. Well, and yeah. then there's, like, the level of the economy. You know, things are so different than the generation before us where they could, you know, have a husband that worked and the wife would stay home and they could still buy their house and pay their mortgage. And now the way society works is you need two incomes in order to provide a, a well-rounded um, support system for your family. And I do think that that all stems kind of back into more... Um, World War One, World War Two era, when people had to, the women had to go into the workplace so that the men could go off to war. And I'm so grateful for that because of the women's rights that came with it, but I also feel like the government then became greedy and got used to the dual income. And that puts so much pressure on on husbands, on wives, on... Yeah, on the know. children not yeah. having their parent, yeah. a parent there yeah. to supervise them and, and actually, like, give them the support that they need. Yeah. And support. then you see the younger generation running around without their parents watching them, getting into trouble because their parents can't. Their parents have to work in order to support their home life. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. I feel like the, the generational effect has become so vast, and it is partially due to the economy. Yeah. And I don't think they're paying attention to the right things that are going on in the world because they're so hooked up on their phones. Like, yeah. I am seeing parents that have given their six months year old a tablet or a phone just to keep them occupied or to keep them, you know, nice and tall and quiet. Yeah. But and I, yeah, that's where the time limit should happen. And that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Like even in a car, they just have those screens for the children to just stare into when they're in the back of the car instead of like how it used to be when people when parents would communicate with their children throughout the ride, right? You know, when we, we, like how our parents would play, like, games, games yeah. with us. Yeah, we, yeah, we you don't know. allow screen time when we're driving. It's yeah. look at the scenery, enjoy the drive. You yeah. don't need to be on the screen the whole time. Yeah. And our youngest does give us a little guff about that, but she's adjusted to the routine and the rule, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's the thing, is it's so hard for every parent to limit screen time but because it, it's kind of like it's kind of like catch twenty two because like you know parents have parents are busy because they have to work mm -hmm. because they they can't afford to just have one parent working mm -hmm. and so they have to improvise some way to entertain the children and keep the children accom um, entertained yeah, yeah you know com accommodated and like you know and so then the children get neglected in a way you know mm -hmm. but. There has to be some way, you know, like, I think, like how you do it, you know, you, you give them some screen time, you give them some game time, and, you know, mm -hmm. and you work at the same time, so it's well balanced. Like, I've seen you, how you are with your children. I saw you at the mall before when oh. you were walking with your kids, and, <laughs> and I'm like, she looks, 
she looks like she's a good mom. Like, her kids look happy. <laughs> I think everybody just tries their mm-hmm. best. And I think a big problem as with being a mother is mom shaming. Like, it's got to stop, okay? I may limit my child's screen time, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to. And my children's intake of screen time is going to be different than your child's, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah, sure, if you can get them to watch learning shows, that's great. But at the same time, at the end of the day, do you actually always want to watch the Discovery Channel? I mean, I do, but not everybody does. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to watch something that is light and breezy and lets you relax Mm -hmm. a little bit. And you know what I heard, too, that um, actually I do this, too, when I am not feeling very well. Cartoons are very good therapy for yeah. mental illness. Mm-hmm. Cartoons, because yes, absolutely. yeah, definitely. You know, you could be having an episode. You could be depressed. You could be anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, you could. It's calming. It's calming yeah. because it takes you away from the world. Mm-hmm. You know, and it puts you in this bright, colorful environment where everybody's happy and everybody's up to something funny. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's actually tried and. And actually, um, there are some video games, too, Mm -hmm. that they have invented Mm -hmm. that is very therapeutic for people with mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. Like, they're actually designed to, like, say, um, there was a game that I heard of before. It's like um, harvesting. It's like you're harvesting crops Mm -hmm. or something. Or landing a plane, Mm -hmm. landing a a shuttle. It's It's supposed to be, like, designed for therapy mm-hmm. and it actually helps your brain to um, align itself yeah. you know when you play those kind of games interesting yeah yeah I saw that on TV before yeah and I feel like that also branches into like doing artwork you know that can really help soothe yourself mm. um, and even you know puzzles reading all those things are yeah. it's really good for your own mental growth but also for your relaxation piece. yeah you know, for those who are fitness fanatics, there's always the gym that they can go to. Oh, yeah. A few hours just to kill, whether they sit on a bike or a treadmill or lift some weights and to do to move your body so that way it can connect with your brain as well because your brain can also recognize where the memory cells from your muscles can actually mm-hmm. reactivate themselves. Mm-hmm. And so it's calm and soothing. They just pop up the music or listen to the music that's playing in the gym. Mm-hmm. just gives them the hours to kill, but they can also give them something to concentrate because there's um, muscle and memory reaction when those who are staring themselves at the mirror actually, they're actually getting their muscles to actually recognize themselves. For instance, okay, so for instance, if someone does a body curl in front of a mirror, it's muscle memory control into which your body is actually learning the movement itself versus when you're not staring at something. Mm-hmm. So you're actually practicing the movement, but you're also seeing the progress along with it as well because you're checking it out, you're teaching yourself the movement along with it, and you're watching the progression as you go along, but also some it actually helps with people who are depressive because it actually also sees the body changes because some people may not feel great about their own appearance, for mm-hmm. instance. Mm-hmm. So people with who want to change their body can actually see that huge change, and it doesn't take like three weeks. That's usually the most common mistake. Mm-hmm. It takes like months, yep. months and months of preparation, and you may have to change a few habits, but the amount of smiles that it puts on people's faces, the amount of joy you can hear in their voice, mm-hmm. and actually see that they're very happy for what it is that they do. They just change the habit, and because they want to find themselves actually in a world, whether what they want to do, play games for therapeutic use, read, draw, go for a little walk, absorb the sunshine, mm-hmm. or go to the gym, something yeah. that just helps cope. It's just because they found a proper coping mechanism that's all natural. Any, anything that makes your endorphins going. That's you know exactly. I was just going to say. The endorphins is one of the most powerful antidepressants that is underused by literally everybody. Endorphin, endorphins can do so much for you. And so can vitamin D. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. the sunshine. It just, it's all endorphins are the chemicals in your brain that, that are called the happy chemicals. Mm-hmm. They, um, your body produces them when you exercise, when you um, in. In, engage in literature like reading, writing, drawing, anything creative. It makes your body happy. It makes your brain happy, and it you know gets your juices flowing, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we also produce uh, all natural levels of serotonin. Mm-hmm. So we have those inhibitors in our mm-hmm. brains that connect, and they have sent those messages. So we, our brain produces all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's actually That's pretty amazing when you think that you have like a ball of mush in your your skull that controls your whole body and 
produces these different chemicals to keep you running happy and yeah. giving you all the different emotions. Controls everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, I hope we've enlightened you a little bit. Um, like, we just like to, sh we like, we like, would have liked to share our experience with you. And um, is there anything more that the two of you would like to add to a, um, our topic? For mental health awareness, um, it shouldn't be just for one month or a day. It's something that needs to be recognized every day. So there's also mental health call centers and lines mm -hmm. that you can contact. There's many of them in Edmonton, Calgary, and even here in Lethbridge. There's a call center for the Canadian, Canadian Mental Health Association that we have here in downtown Lethbridge. You can always call them. They're on 24 hours. And if you can't connect to a doctor, always give them a call that if you're aware or if you're having an episode or you just need someone to talk to if you're really feeling down or if you're feeling suicidal, those call centers are always open 24-7. So make sure you contact them if you ever need them. There's also a crisis line, yeah. Crisis line, crisis and suicide hotline um, that you can call. Everything's, you, uh, you can Google everything and find out what the numbers are. And in dire straits, call 911. You can definitely get the appropriate help that you need. Um, it doesn't have to always be a severe emergency if you really just need to find out where you can get the appropriate help that you need from. You can call 911 and they will help you. And don't be ashamed. You know. Don't be ashamed. It's nothing to be ashamed of. No, never be. And it's very important that you find love for yourself and all of that. And if that means that you're asking for help, that's the beginning of you loving yourself more. And when it comes to other people as well, if you know somebody is struggling, don't be afraid to reach out to them. The best thing that you can do for that person is show that you care. Yeah. Always use your ears. Let them know that you're listening. Mm -hmm. Let them have a shoulder to cry on. And the best thing that you can do for yourself and for them is make it a personal goal every single day to make either someone smile, laugh, and to brighten their day no matter what whether they're having a great day or if they're having a bad day. The best thing to have as a daily goal is to make sure you make someone smile or laugh. I try to do that every single day, no matter what it is I do. In my per professional life, as a education assistant or a behavioral aide for family services, or in my own personal life with all my friends and family, I always want to make someone's day someone better, even if it's just one or multiple people. At least I know that I did my job and I met my daily goal. It's just because I know that I did the right thing. Well, that has been the Pumped Up Show tonight. I am Julia Martinez, and these are my guests, Tom McCullo and Crystal Tanner. And um, mental illness, is, they're like tiger stripes. Wear them with pride. So good night, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next Wednesday at 7.30 Mountain Standard Time here on jessfm.ca.